on the invite, invited lectures for the section of History of Mathematics of this ICM. Uh, the last invited lecture will be by Tatiana Roque from the Mathematical Institute of the Federal University of Brazil in Rio de Janeiro. Um, somehow I think it's quite appropriate that the program committee has placed a talk to put into context an institution like IMPA here. And Tatiana will highlight us, enlighten us with this. Let me just incidentally add the information for those who are not Brazilians that Tatiana Roque is running for deputy in the next elections. Please. <laughs> Thank you. So, thank you very much. And I, I will speak about uh, the Institute for Pure and Applied Mathematics and its coming of age in a context of Cold War. And after the Second World War, the context of Cold War had particular impact in Latin America. And here we can see a newspaper from Rio de Janeiro, where the National Research Council announces the creation of IMPA, and in the same page there are announcements related to Cold War, like Eisenhower's campaign to become US president and his disagreements with Truman that uh, included support for Cold War strategies. So it was in 1952, in October 1952, and the National Research Council has been created the year before, in 1951, by an ad uh, Admiral Avo Roberto da Motti Silva with a small group of scientists like Cesar Lattes and Leite Lopes. And the goals of this council was to create infrastructure for the nuclear sector connected with the field of atomic physics, what explains the role of these physicists and also to boost economic development with the strategic role of nuclear power for both industry and national security, and to construct a sovereign position to Brazil in a Cold War background, using supposedly existing mineral resources that in fact did not exist, but they believed it existed in these times. And Leite Lopes, in discussing the creation of the national uh, the Center for Physics, the Brazilian Center for Physics, the C CBPF, said that Brazil had to overcome his condition of science-starving country. So there were a lot of nationalist arguments involved in this discussion for the creation of infrastructure for science in Brazil in these years. It was in 1949. And uh, also, Leite Lopes said, that it was not possible to create this infrastructure in the university because the statesmen were very influential and did not choose priorities and professors and directors based only on scientific criteria. So it was necessary to create these institutes outside university. And internationalization was also a mean to to, to go against this national narrow-minded statesman. And there are a lot of testimonies like that. And, and in this context of Cold War, in history of science in the 20th century, there is a literature investigating big science showing that after the Second World War, big science reshaped the very meaning of science and came to symbolize modernity. And it effectively, it created a new meaning for science as a contract stimulated in its technical scientific dimension by the Cold War. And when scientists pragmatically exploited the possibilities that the state had to provide material resources for science, producing an identification between science, state power, and prestige. So in this context, Cold War politicized some domains intimately tied to national security and interstate rivalry. And the nuclear and the space occupy a very particular niche in such a project. There are a lot of historians of science studying this context, as John Creech, Dominique Pestre, and others. I will speak a little bit about this 
literature, specifically this book that John Creed wrote with Naomi Oreskes, uh, asking what role national ambitions played in fostering, enabling, or disabling certain lines of investigation. And what roles geopolitics played in shaping choices and defining spheres of possibility for concrete research. There are some works in history of Brazilian institutions investigating this context, but they do not, do not touch mathematics and a little bit physics. But it's more turned to other contexts, other disciplines. And in this book, mathematics is not addressed also. So, the question appears about the connection between this scientific policy and the presumed need for an advanced research institute in mathematics. This question is still more interesting that mathematics done at IMPA had nothing to do with nuclear physics. So, we can ask what is the relationship between this political atmosphere and the core subject matter of mathematical research. This is the question I will address, and it's a question particularly difficult to answer in the case of mathematics and has not been explored yet. So, if you look closer to the development of mathematics in Brazil during this time, dynamical systems theory was becoming the main direction of research at the end of the 60s. And I will explore the possible relationships between this choice and a Cold War environment. In particular, the changing priorities connected to the international development of mathematics and the role acquired by the United States in these times. So, first of all, I will treat only this period. It is important to fix the limits of the historic period I've chosen. We will be talking only about this interval that we can call a period of institutionalization, formalization of research, giving birth to an institution that, in fact, will be created as an institution only after 71, so only in the 70s. In this period, just to, to, to remind a few dates, in 49, the Brazilian Center for the Research in Physics, and then in, in 51, the National Research Council, and in 52, IMPA started its activities in a room of CBPF, of the, the Center for Brazilian Physics, and only in 57, it moved for, to another building. And I forgot to say that these arts work that is I'm using the conference are not for decoration purposes, but they are following the timeline of this presentation. So they are artworks from Brazilian artists from the same years as I'm, I'm uh, speaking about in this presentation. So another discussion that uh, was uh, important in the creation of IMPA was about the necessity to create protected spaces outside universities and free from the constraints imposed by universities. There existed the University of Brazil, now UFRG, since 1939, with mathematics and physics department being created. But the issue uh, of creating these spaces outside university were very important in the debates in the National Research Council for the creation of IMPA. And because some members had the position that it, they should create a course inside the university, as Batista Pereira and Joaquim Costa Ribeiro. But they were convinced by other members, like Cândido Dias, with the support of the president of the Academy of Science, Arthur Moses, that it was better to create an independent institute. And this independence was justified by the fact that universities could only have a small number of professors fully dedicated to research. And the names of Leopoldo Narbi and Mauricio Peixoto were evoked because they were not full professors at university. So we should create a space, a protected space, where they could work. But this is not a Brazilian singularity, 
because the discussion about creating centers outside the university had similar aspects in Brazil and other countries as India, where the whole of science in constructing a sovereign and modern state had to do with the development of advanced institutions outside the university. After Indian independence, so exactly in 1949, the Council of Scientific and Industrial Research created the Theta Institute for Fundamental Research, also uh, for, to research in nuclear physics. And research systems has been described in terms of a dualism, and these researchers, these historians of science, about that studies Indian science says that the tasks of national development imply the creation of elite institutions where, I cite, young men of the highest intellectual calibre in a society could be trained. So, in both countries, forming a scientific elite was seen as a key strategy to the mission of building a new nation. I give some names that were, a few names, in fact, that were in IMPA in this period. And uh, in the beginning, in 52, there were Mauricio Peixoto and Leopoldo Nahr being doing mathematics, and Lelio Gama was only the, the director. And then in 56 and 58, Elon Lima and Paulo Ribbonboin, that stayed a little bit here and then went to Europe. And then in, in 65, Lindolfo Carvalho Dias was the director. And finally, Manfredo do Carmo and Jacob Palis, that came back in the end of the 60s that Jacob Pal is doing his PhD in the United States, and Manfredo for, from an experience at the University of Brasilia. And this is, in fact, the end of my period. And so just justify why I'm ending in this period. This period, researchers returning from their PhD and from this experience in Brasilia University created the, a graduate school at IMPA. Before that, the theses were done at IMPA, but the diploma were given by, were, by the University of Brazil. And in 71, Leopoldo Narbin left IMPA, saying it was for personal reasons, but we will discuss a little bit more about that. And a turning point, to this new phase of IMPA after 71 was the symposium held at Salvador. So in this period, in the period treated here for, from 49 to 71, the history of IMPA was confused with personal trajectories of the few people doing research there, in particular Leopoldo Narbin and Mauricio Peixoto, who, did, who directed almost all theses done at IMPA during this period. So to speak about mathematics done at IMPA is to speak about their researchers in the period treated here. So, and I will describe a little bit their works with emphasis in the case of Narbi, in the Bourbaki influence on his works. He did important works in other domains. He worked with Marshall Stone and others, but he had a lasting relationship with the Berbakist approach. At the same time that Mauricio Peixoto was starting to work in dynamical systems. So I will speak now a little bit of their works. Since uh, 1945, Narbin had a very close relationship with Burbaki members. Some of them were at the University of São Paulo as André Veil and after him Giordone and others. And in 48, Narbin went to Chicago to work with André Veil that was there in Chicago also. And in 48, he wrote a monograph on topological vector spaces to train young researchers in this point of view. And colleagues credit Snarbin with having promoted in Brazil the Burbaki spirit, and that means that writing in Burbaki language was the language of topological vector spaces. So we find that in theses done in Brazil in this period, for example, the thesis of Cândido Silva Dias. In 57, Laurent Schwartz had proposed extending to distributions with vector values the main properties of ordinary scalar distributions. And Narbin was very interested in this approach and wanted to go to Paris to follow Schwartz's seminar in order to study topological properties of spaces of distributions. But he did not end up going because Schwartz was more interested in the applications of distributions to theoretical physics. 
So in 61, finally, Nahbing went to Paris, supposedly to work with Schwartz, but regarding seeing what he did there, he did not work with Schwartz. He uh, went very often to Pierre Lelong's seminar, he interacted with André Martineau, but very little with Schwartz himself. And then he left Paris. It is a good historical question to investigate why. But he left Paris very interested in the study of topologies of spaces of holomorphic mappings, in particular, infinite dimension, dimensional spaces. His goal was to extend Schwartz's results on distributions to infinite dimensional spaces. And then he went to the University of Rochester and gave courses about this and he proposed to teach analysis on a topological vector spaces, and this should prevail over analysis in Rn, because for him, this intrinsic viewpoint was useful in dealing with infinite dimensional vector spaces. And in, in, in 65, as we have some testimonies also about that, for example, from John Hovart, that he started to build a very important theory, totally original, the theory of holomorphic functions in Banner spaces with applications to partial differential equations in these spaces. So Narbi believed he was founding a new field of research. And he also had students that came to IMPA to study that, these researchers. But in the 60s, the point of view of topological vector spaces was not unanimously recognized as being so interesting as it was before. And in the, some letters exchanged between Narbi and Schwartz, we can see a little bit that because uh, uh, Narbi proposed Schwartz, he was coming to Brazil, and he proposed that Schwartz gave a course on holomorphic mappings, and Schwartz said he had nothing to speak about that. He says that all he had to say about topological vector spaces and partial differential equations, he had already said, and it does not seem very interested in studying the question via topology of spaces of holomorphic functions, as now have been proposed. He was more interested in applying his theory of distributions on uh, theoretical physics, in particular the Lorentz groups. So we feel that since the end of the 50s, we see some discomfort with the generality of Berbakin's approach, and here and especially in Chicago, where Andre Veil was with Brazilian mathematicians as Elo Lima, Narbi, and uh, Peixoto also was there. And uh, we have a testimony here of, um, I, I have to... No, no, no. Analysts, topologists, geometers agree, if you go for generality, go for significant, gosh, uh -huh. go for generality, there is no one, but go back here, one theorem by them is worth ten by you and or me, go back here, goes bashing all night. It's uh, Elon Lima singing in the last interview I did with him. And uh, he says that uh, Bourbaki's approach was considered too general and too restrictive for finding standard results. And the results were needed to create a mathematical community. And so mathematicians saw this generality that was uh, 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 very important in Bourbaki's approach was not suitable for this research program that they, where, where they, uh, they were seeking for results, for finding standard results. So we see in the song that Bourbaki was not very productive to, for, for the finding of standard results. So, about the, 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 the line of research chosen by Narbi, the study of topologies of spaces of holomorphic mappings with an extension to infinite dimension did not have the success Narbi expected. And when he left IMPA in 1971, questions were more numerous than answers, and people like Andrei Irskovich and others that were, did research in this domain talked about the poverty of the theory in regard of the hopes we could put in it. So, in this thesis of Anne-Sandrine Pommier about Schwartz, 
uh, he, she, she speaks about the point of view proposed by Schwartz in 1957 met some resistance during the 60s. The success of the works of Lars Homander uh, was a proof of that because he treated the theory of distributions without practices linked to topological vector spaces. And Sandrine Pommier uh, talks about the, prog the, pro the progressive decline during the 60s of what she calls the writing practices of topological vector spaces. So, at the same time, I arrived at the end of the 60s, and at the same time, in the 50s and the 60s, we witnessed the rise of applied mathematics in the United States. Solomon Lefschetz is an exemplary figure in this scenario because he was an active figure during the boom of topology in the 50s, and then he moved to differential equations, bringing topology. And at the same time, the United States was becoming a leading mathematical power, and very linked to applied mathematics, and applied mathematics gained importance in these times. So to come again to the context of Cold War, just off after the launch of the Sputnik in 1957, it became clear that it was necessary, in Lefschetz's words, to fill the mathematical gap between Soviet Union and the US. And Lefschetz started a research program on nonlinear differential equations funded by the Office of Naval Research. And so he uh, allowed him to translate important works of the Soviet school and introduce it in the United States, concepts formulated by Andronov and his research group on the theory of oscillations. So there was a book written by Andronov and his group called Theory of Oscillations in Russian. And uh, Lefschetz translated this book in 49. And also, this article became very known, that was written in, in 37, but became known uh, in this group of Lefschetz, about what I will explain later, what uh, Systeme Grossier, that are core system. I will explain a little bit this discussion. So, these books, uh, this book about the theory of oscillation begins with a very deep discussion about the role of models, with using the word model in Russian, in 37. So, uh, they say, Andronov and the, others, the other colleagues that wrote this, this book with him, that a model was a necessary idealization in order to study a physical reality. But the properties of models are not inherited from reality. Oscillations can give rise to different models, highlighting linear or nonlinear, dissipative or conservative properties. And the properties of the model are obtained from questions we make to reality. So how to guarantee the model so obtained is appropriate to idealize the physical reality? It shall resist the answer to small imprecisions that are inevitable in idealization, giving rise to models. The mathematical translation of that, if we, t we take these models as being differentiable systems, the, the mathematical translation of this requirement is that the solutions do not change qualitatively when we perturb the system itself. A system satisfying these demands is called grossier in, in, uh, in French, because they write in French the article, that can be translated by course. So it was the same time, the 40s, that the adoption of a general notion of mathematical model in the behavioral science, in, econom in, in economy, for instance, with the book of von Neumann that appeared in 1944. So there was this discussion about the use and the dissemination of the notion of model in the middle of the 20th century. So in the article about the core system, System Grossier, published in 37, Andronov and Pontriagin uh, gave the mathematical condition for two systems to be, for a system, for a system to be coarse or grossier. So for a two-dimensional system, they write the system like this, where P and Q are two systems 
uh, of analytic functions that are perturbed for small perturbations, and the system is grossier if this perturbation keeps its trajectories modulo uh, homeomorphism. And in 49, this property of being grossier is renamed by Lefschetz as structural stable. So there comes Mauricio Peixoto, and he went to Chicago from 49 to 51, but to work on analysis, nothing to do with dynamic systems. And then he discovered this work of Lefschetz and went back to the United States to work with Lefschetz in 57. And in 59, he led a round table on structural stability in a symposium on differential equations in Mexico. And in 59, and then in 62, he wrote two very known articles about structural stability. And I will speak a little bit about this first article. My goal is to show how this context have impact, uh, has impact in the mathematics. So I will describe a little bit his mathematics in this article to speak about the, how the context can have influence in the results he was announcing in this article. So, Peixoto proposed that the key notions for the development of a theory of dyna dynamical systems were structural stability and generosity. For him, the main goal of the mathematics of his time was to classify mathematical objects by means of equivalence relations. So the suggestion already given by Poincaré of generally classifying differential equations had to be fulfilled with notions from set theory. And so he says that it was necessary to express the theory of differential equations in a set theoretic language. And for this, uh, he did two things. First, uh, they, they have to have a notion of qualitative equivalence that was answered by uh, homeomorphism, transforming trajectories of one system into trajectories of the other, as already suggested by Andronov and Pontryagin. But the original proposition of Peixoto is the second one, is to define a space of differential equations or dynamical systems possessing a topological structure. So a dynamical system was seen as a point in a Banach space. So this, is, this seems very simple today, but in this, in this time it was something new. And we will look closer to this result. So in this article of 59, uh, she, uh, he, he starts by the definition of structural stability given by Andronov and Pontryagin, showing this definition is equivalent to another one that can be extended to n dimensions, because the one of Andronov and Pontryagin was uh, done in two dimensions. And then he wanted to study how the set of structurally stable systems is embedded in the set of differentiable systems considered as a Banach space. So he um, wants to study this set of all structurally stable systems in a set of all differentiable systems considered as a Banach space. For this, he had to define a distance in this space that he defined it like this. So Peixoto wanted to organize the structurally stable systems in the Banach spaces into equivalent cl classes, modulo uh, homeomorphism, transforming trajectories onto trajectories. It was something difficult to do in dimensions greater than two. He did that in dimension two, but in dimension greater than two, he announced the problem if, 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 even if he did not answer the question. So, uh, he showed that the set of all structurally stable systems is an open cone with at most an innumerable number of connected components. And if two systems belong to the same component, there is a homomorphism onto uh, transforming trajectories of one onto trajectories of the other. And the constraint found there is that two systems may have the same trajectories and yet one is structurally stable and the other is not. 
The problem is posed by the nature of singularities, and Peixoto solves this problem with works from Whitney, and that read this, his article and gave him some suggestions coming from singularity theory. And also there are uh, this discussion that were done that was done by Whitney in collaboration with Henne Tom and presented in Burbaki's seminar in these uh, in these years. And then Tom came to Rio also in 61 and discussed the other property Peixoto was interested in, the property of genericity. I'm not uh, speaking a lot about genericity here, more about structural stability, but I have an article about uh, genericity. So, um, so we can say that all these collaborations gave rise to a research program that was conceived by Peixoto and others that synthesized, on the one hand, a less formal, more applied, and more oriented to specific problems, mathematics, and on the other, abstract and general concerns following a set theoretic approach. And this approach is sufficiently, sufficiently general to give rise to a research program beyond specific results. So, there is a, wor a work, a historical work, still to be done, that I'm just uh, formulating but not solving this problem, is to, to show how other practices had influence on the works of Smail, because he took, uh, the, this, he, took the, this, he took it over, the works after Peixoto, it was Smail that took it over, but also with influence of other uh, practices. For instance, the practice, the practice of applied topology came from the Institut de Autitude Scientifique, René Tom, and so on, and also applied domains, applied domains as oscillations, v Van der Poel equation, Norman Levinson, Norbert Wiener, uh, uh, all studying at the Institute, for, uh, the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, von Neumann, etc. So, this shows that the tension between examples, physical examples, and mathematical categories has been a driving force in this development, reaffirming the prevalence of modeling practices. But this is a historical work still to be done, and it would be interesting to use to do this work the, the methodology of network of texts that describes originality in this case of Smeo, as a collective phenomena. That is a methodology already used by Catherine Goldstein, Frédéric Berger-Macher, and myself, studying the originality of Poincaré in dynamical systems. And I showed, for instance, that from Poincaré to Birkhoff, there are a network of texts that uh, depict originality of Poincaré and Birkhoff as a collective phenomena, and it would be necessary to apply this methodology to study the works of Smale I'm citing. Because after the period treated here, it was Smale that took it over, and he came to Brazil in, in the 60s, and then went also to Moscow, and interacted with Arnold Sinai Anozov, and then he got the Fields Medal at the ICM of Moscow, and interacted with other people working in the subject that, were, that was there. And in 67, he wrote uh, a, a kind of review explaining the state of art of the theory in these times, differential the differentiable dynamical systems that is cited by a lot of researchers working in the domain after 67. So in Brazil, in 64, the first three theses done at IMPA, supervised by Peixoto, were defended from Aristides Barreto, Ivan Kupka, and Sotomayor. And, uh, but after that, Peixoto went back to the United States to work in the Center for Dynamical Systems that Lefschetz directed, and the research at IMPA was conducted mostly by Narbi. And this in, in 64, it was the year when Jacopalis went to the United States to study with Smail. And so it's the mathematical gen genealogy project where we see here, uh, here is, is Mail, and here Jacopalis, and here Maurice Hirsch. So the only, this not 
with 261 descendants, and the other of Smeo's st students to have a comparable number of descendants is Maurice Hirsch, but William Thurston was a student of Hirsch, and Hirsch descendants are concentrated in Thurston descendants here. So we see that the descendants of Jacopalis are more numerous. So all this helped to constitute this um, community that would be important in the next phase of IMPA after 71. That's why I speak about this turning point of the colloquium of, Salva of Salvador in 71 that was financed by the Brazilian government and the Ford Foundation. And I do a rapid name dropping here, only to have an idea, but we will have to organize these names. It is part of the historical work to be done. So, but this, the program, this program served the, the project to develop an internationalized mathematical research center in Brazil with a special role of relationships between Brazil and the United States. So I will come back to my macro history, macro scale history, and speak a little bit about US influence and the question of Americanization that some historians prefer now to call transnational action. So, in this period, after the Second World War, there, there is a description in historiography of a French uh, decline in Brazil, French influence decline, and an increase of American influence. And it is shown by different works using examples from medicine, biology, etc., and does not treat physics or mathematics. There is also a literature about the influence of U.S. foundations in mathematical research and how it was turning to South America. This is the Peixoto application to a grant for a grant uh, of Rockefeller Foundation in 1950. Also, Narbi and other Brazilian mathematicians got grants from these foundations. So, this discussion of um, how the relationship, the relationship with the United States, uh, had influence in mathematics done in Brazil is important, but it was also a discussion in other domains of culture in this period. For instance, the Americanization of Brazilian culture was very important in the controversy over American influence on Brazilian art and music, particularly in Bossa Nova. In 1958, when Bossa Nova is considered to be created with this music from João Gilberto Chega de Saudade, it was uh, one of the goals was to show that this music was not a product of American acculturation as some music composed before, but it mixed elements of Brazilian music with American jazz following a modernization trend. Also in art, this discussion was present. So, but uh, historians of science uh, see the concept of Americanization as historians of time, as John Creech, for instance, in this book, in the book cited here, they see the concept of Americanization as being too general and totalizing to be of much analytical value. Because the influence cannot be seen as acculturation, but as appropriation since the social actors navigated between the attractions of the American way and they selectively appropriated, adapted, or simply rejected the model on offer to satisfy the specificities of particular situations. And uh, this is uh, appropriate to speak of Brazilian mathematics in this period because Brazilian mathematicians had an active role in this development of dynamical systems, helping to shape a network of collaborations that had impact on mathematical research. But to, to, to come to this conclusion, we have to look closer to mathematics and the example of Peixoto is important for us to understand what kind of impact this network can have on mathematical research and in the core of mathematics. So, if we look at that, this diagram, simplify a diagram like this, we could perhaps speak about Americanization of mathematics. But it is not appropriate for us since 
First of all, it would be ironic to call Americanization a transnational influence with so intense participation of the Soviet school. And we see that one of Peixoto's major innovations was the adaptation of a proposal first introduced by Soviet mathematicians S. Andronov and Pontryagin. Then Peixoto was influenced by Lefschetz and topologists S. Whitney and Tom. And Smail was later influenced by Soviet mathematicians S. Arnold, Sinai, and Ozov. And most of all, the role of Brazilians as Peixoto, but also Jacob Alice, is expressed in constructive terms. So it's not a question of reception, as the diagram suggests, and that shows the importance of networks and micro, and micro historical point of view. But there is, however, one aspect in which we can effectively speak of US influence, and it has to do with patronage and relationships with state priorities and scientific policy that were influenced by the United States. So, in 64, there was the military coup d'etat in Brazil, and uh, it has to do with changes in the global scene, and the US was acquiring an increasingly prominent role in mathematics, and the Cold War had also impact on national politics. This context helped the financing of mathematics. In 65, for instance, a fund was created for financing studies and projects operated by the National Bank for the Economic Development that was very important in financing IMPA during the 70s. And this bank funded studies for modernization and industrialization with a lot of money from the Inter-American Development Bank and from the United States Agency for International Development. After that, it was the time of political repression, and during the Salvador Symposium, we also find a uh, mention to that, because Ismael dedicated his article to a, mathemati a Brazilian mathematician that was in prison in this year, Alexandre Magalhães. And then, we can return to our question on how Cold War, IMPA, what is the relationship between Cold War, IMPA, and the core of mathematics? So, the geopolitical situation restructured the relationship between government, patronage agencies, and scientists. This whole process was governed by informal evaluations and political negotiations with the aim of building a new world-class institution. The connection with research centers in the United States guaranteed the means for Brazilian mathematicians to take part in ongoing changes at the global scenario. And the focus on dynamical systems in this context took on a strategic role as it enabled a combination of various elements. Dynamical systems theory helped to build a modern image associated with the trends of the time. It demanded little tradition in mathematics and forged a synthesis between two trends. A hint of applied mathematics, not applied exactly, but driven by applied concerns and in association with the applied trend that was becoming dominant in the US, and the field was seen as being useful to applied domains, even if it did not always focus on effective applications. And that has to do with these Soviet Union works that investigated the, the role of models. And secondly, the second trend, is that it, uh, uh, it uh, put forward a research program with a classificatory verve not so far from set theory and general results coming from Bourbaki lineage also, but through a topological detour done by these researchers like Tom and other uh, studying uh, this practice of applied topology. So uh, it's... Uh, uh, dynamical systems can be seen as the synthesis that uh, has to do with the context treated here. The constitution of dynamical systems theory as a priority is inseparable from the fabrication of IMPA itself as an international, autonomous, and modern mathematical centers with financial means to develop national and international collaborations. So we see from this example that the social and institutional dimension is intimately linked with the conceptual. 
It was not a research, a research center that came to do research in dynamical systems. The history of IMPA and the history of dynamical systems go together in this first period. Then it changes a little bit. So, um, coming to, to my conclusion, uh, I want to, to speak a little bit about what historical analysis does using this example. Because this history, as told by actors, is full of personal testimonies and memories, personal explanations. For instance, Peixoto found an, er an error in the baggage article. Elon Lima introduced him to Lefschetz. Narbi left Impa because he had a strong character and there were fights. Ismail knew both of them and came to Rio. Palis studied with Ismail and met people who helped him financing encounters, etc. But it's true that things happened as they happened because some people decided. But who can decide? How do people decide things? Which political factors have impact on such decisions and which kind of impact? The whole of historian is to highlight the social, di the social dimensions that appears in two scales here, a, a micro scale and a macro scale. Uh, first of all, uh, the, in the micro scale, the collective phenomena shows direct or indirect interactions between people and texts, networks uh, making a practice emerge that gives sense to originality, as we, we, we showed in the works of Peixoto. And the originality can be seen as not in this network. And secondly, geopolitics, patronage, and scientific policy open or close possibilities, and the consequences can be seen in the priorities chosen by mathematicians, as we showed here, that it was also convenient to choose dynamical systems for the development of this modern institution. So, for this second uh, trend, that is geopolitics, patronage, and scientific policy, we show how it had impact in Brazil in these years, and it was uh, during the 60s that Brazilian scientific policy constructed these institutions that are important up to the present. The institutions like the National Research Council and scientific institutions as IMPA and the National, Research Cent the National Research Center in Physics, and uh, also uh, program, uh, gra graduate programs at universities. And I don't resist to finish showing how this has impact now, so relating scientific production and public investments that made Brazilian science and research in, this e in, the, in, in recent years to increase and to have to acquire uh, an importance, for instance, here is for mathematics, and now with the public investments decreasing, all these structures is threatened. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for an interesting and motivating lecture. We have uh, some minutes for questions. I just remind everybody that at 6 is the Leila Bhatti Prize Lecture, so let's go for as many questions as possible but with a time limit. So, are there any questions? Yes. So, so I have a possibly strange question. I want to focus back on the 50s and ask about gender, because in American mathematics, the proportion of women getting PhDs, they were small, but they had the highest proportion in the 30s. The early days of computing were dominated by women, and this all got destroyed with the GI Bill. The guys came home, they needed jobs, the generals took over computing, and they ran everything, and Rosie the mathematician went home. And it didn't bounce back till the 80s. France had a similar thing. How did gender in mathematics work with the generals running things versus the universities, whatever? How did that work in Brazil? But in the 50s? F in the in the f well, 50s is the critical turning point yeah, in the States. Yeah, because it's a very recent worry in Brazilian science. This, in mathematics, we, we, have, we started to have uh, Brazil, uh, 
uh, researchers, uh, women researchers in mathematics, much more recent. In these times I, I'm talking about, there were some, but very, very few. So it's a, it's a, a very recent concern. But in the, States, the question. in the States, people have the same perception. They don't think women did mathematics before the First World War, I mean, Second World War. But they were mainly educated in Germany and uh, there was a... a, but, a but yeah, but the difference is that here it was a very, very small community. Right. So we can count, the, when you talk about mathematicians in the 50s, we can okay. count them. So it, it was a very small community. So it was not that we forgot, it was that it, okay. it was not... Uh, and, and where did the driving force for ge gender roles changing? Will they come in the university, in the institutes, or whatever? No, it's uh, in the university is better than in the institutes for the for this matter. In, in my university, there are a lot of women doing mathematics. At IMPA, there is only Carolina, and so it's. Any further question? Thank you, Tatiana. Um, you showed beautifully that uh, a da dynamical system fit the bills, and really several bills at the same time. Uh, do you think it was completely determined somehow? Uh, would you say that there is one single topic which should fit all these bills? Or, for instance, that the, um, the preceding trajectory of the person there would lead them really in this direction only? or? Do you think there were a lot of choices, and have you some hints about that? Yeah, I, I think I think uh, there there are two things. I think there there were also the right people in the right places in the right time. So there are, there's a lot of chance also, but also they profited for the the opening of opportunities that were very important in this history also, the financial on travels and uh, all that. And so uh, I think it was the convergence of all these factors, in fact. It was uh, a choice, but also opportunity and to be in the right place in the right time. So it, w it is really a, a, con a convergence, a convergence of different factors to... Any other question? Hi. So, uh, several decades have elapsed since your historical cut. I, I'm not. I'm not a, a lot has happened sorry. since your since 1971. Several generations of Brazilians have studied abroad, come back. There have been uh, lots of interesting movements. In particular, the uh, protagonism of the universities around Impa, sort of further yeah, and yeah, further yeah, from yeah. Rio, has gradually increased. Yeah. Do, do you think you could perhaps offer an overview of the uh, protagonism space of uh, non impa institutions in Brazilian mathematics today? But, but before 71 or after 71? Possibly after 71. Ah. No, it's because I think... 2018. Yeah, uh, th there is also a gap in my research here, because from 64 to 71, I think w I, ha I have to do a deeper research, historical research, to, uh, to, to trace these networks and this relationship. And after 71, it's uh, still a harder work, because there will be more researchers and more centers. So I think uh, what I'm, I'm showing here is really a research program in history of mathematics, in history of Brazilian mathematics and the history of dynamical systems. So it's just the first uh, uh, provocation, you know, just the first uh, uh, qu opening questions. And uh, I really was, um, did a deep research up to Peixoto. After that, I showed some elements, but I think there is a lot of historical work to be done. So, to answer your question, I think it would be another historical work, but it's really too, too large for, as a, a research team. Okay, any further question? So, if not, we thank the speaker again.